Good morning, physics scholars. In this tutorial, we're going to take a look at the physics of a car going around a curve and take a look at the role that friction plays in this, uh, in this situation. And uh, we're going to start by looking at a car that's going around a curve where the road is perfectly flat. All right, and then we're going to take a look and see how the situation changes if the curve is banked. All right, so let's do this. That's really bad. Okay, let's start by taking a look at car from above. So here's my car, and I'm looking down from above, and this car is following a path like that. So at any moment in time, the car has a velocity, which is tangent to this path, and since it's moving in a circle, this is uniform circular motion, it's experiencing a centripetal acceleration, which is center pointing towards the center of the uh, path that it's following. All right, so this is what the situation looks like from above. Let's redraw the situation from behind from the back. So here's my car and it's on the road and let's erase that. What are the forces acting on this car? The car has a weight equal to its mass times the acceleration due to gravity. The road exerts a normal force. Let's call that F sub n. <clears throat> and then what force is actually supplying the centripetal force which allows this car to go around the turn? And that would be friction between the tires and the road. Let's call that F sub FR for friction. So this is a free body diagram where up and down is the y-axis and then the x-axis is an axis that points toward the center of the path that the car is traveling on. So we could call it the radial axis, or I suppose the centripetal axis, um, but let's just call it the x-axis since we're used to doing that. Okay, so um, if we define our coordinate axes like this, then we can use Newton's second law to write down uh, an expression for the net force on the car in the vertical direction, the y direction, and the net force in the in the x direction, uh, or this direction that points toward the center of its path. Let me just write that out here. So x here means the direction toward the center of uh, the turn or the curve. Okay. And in this case, the force of friction is supplied by static friction. And so in class, we learned that static friction is always less than some coefficient of static friction times the normal force. So let's, let's pursue uh, a situation here where what we're interested in is uh, answering how fast can the car go around this turn? And so as the the faster the car goes, the more centripetal force is required to make that turn, and thus more friction is required to supply the force necessary to make that turn. And so really, if we say how fast is the car going, what we're really asking is to find the, the speed where the force of friction is equal to its maximum. So we know that the, the static friction is always less than or equal to mu s times the normal force. But we want to know what is the speed where the force of friction is its maximum. And that's the maximum speed that can be attained. If you go any faster, static friction won't be able to supply the centripetal force and you'll start skidding off the road. All right, so let's write down a Newton's second law expression for the net force in the y direction. And that's going to equal up as positive, so we have the normal force pointing up minus the weight of the car pointing down. And that is going to equal the mass of the car times its rate of acceleration in that dimension, which is zero. <clears throat> it's not accelerating up and down. 
So that yields knowledge that the normal force is equal to the weight of the car. All right, so now we'll turn our attention to the x direction, the direction that's pointing toward the center of the curve. And the net force in that direction is, there's only one force, the force of friction, which is equal to, at its maximum, the coefficient of friction times the normal force. And that equals the mass of the car times its rate of acceleration in that direction. And since we're dealing with uniform circular motion here, the acceleration in that direction, the centripetal acceleration, is v squared over r. Now remember that. Centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. So uh, we can plug our knowledge of the normal force equal to the weight into this expression. And we get mu s times mg equals m v squared over r. And we have a situation where the mass of the car is on both sides of the equation, so that cancels. And if we solve for v, we get v equals the coefficient of static friction times the acceleration due to gravity times the radius of the curve square root. <clears throat> so how fast can a car go around a turd? It depends on these uh, situations. V is going to be larger, the maximum speed that a car can take a curve is going to be larger if the radius of the curve is larger. Um, that makes sense. Um, the maximum speed that the car can have and successfully negotiate a turn is going to be larger if the coefficient of static friction is larger. There's better static friction between the tires and the road. Uh, and that makes sense as well. Okay, so now let's change things a little bit. All right, come over here. And so now let's, let's see how the situation, how these equations change if the curve is banked. And we'll see that this, this actually introduces a lot more complexity to the problem. And by banked, what I mean is the, the car is turning, and as it's turning, the road, so again, this is the view from the back, the road makes some angle uh, with the with horizontal as the car goes around the turn. So now, um, you know, what are the forces acting on this vehicle? It's the same forces. We have the weight of the car, which is mg. We have the normal force, which now is at an angle relative to vertical because the road is banked. And then we have friction. And friction, this is a little strange, but friction oops, is going to point down the incline toward the center with a component that points toward the center of the curve. So this has to be true because friction is between the tires and the road, and that force has to be parallel to that surface of contact. But in this case, you could choose coordinate axes just like we did before, or in other situations where we've had inclines, we've chosen coordinate axes which are rotated so that the x-axis is parallel with the uh, incline. And so in this case, um, we will, let's not do this. Let's not do this. Let's proceed with these coordinate axes. And the reason is because if we choose that, then the direction that's pointing toward the center of the curve is still the x-axis. The x-axis still points toward the center. And uh, I, I prefer it that way. Um, and it might make it the problem a little bit easier. Um, and the reason is because if you write out things like this, then the net force in the y direction is still going to equal zero because there's no acceleration in the up and down direction. Let's take a closer look 
at uh, the free body diagram for this problem because things are uh, a little bit more complicated now. So we have an X axis and a Y axis. And now the normal force makes an angle where to the Y axis equal to theta, the angle of incline. And the friction force makes an angle equal to theta with the x-axis. And the weight of the car is straight down the y-axis. And so in this uh, situation, what you have then is, well, the normal force then is going to have a y component and an x component. And the frictional force is going to have an X component and a Y component. And we're still interested in the maximum amount of friction that static friction can provide uh, because we're going to pursue the same answer, uh, the same question as before. What's the maximum speed that you can go around this turn? And uh, so that means that friction has a, a, a Y component equal to mu S times the normal fire force times the sine of the angle of incline. And it has an X component equal to mu S times the normal force cosine of the angle of incline. In the same way, the normal force has an X component equal to Fn sine theta and an X uh, of, sorry, uh, in the same way, the normal force has an X component equal to Fn sine theta and a Y component equal to Fn cosine theta, okay? So I'm using trigonometry to break these force vectors, Fn, the normal force, and Frf, the frictional force, into x and y components. And at this point, I'm ready to write down uh, a Newton's second law expression for the net force in the y direction and the net force in the x direction. So the net force in the y direction is going to equal, let's see, I have the y component of the normal force pointing up in the positive y direction. And I have the y component of the frictional force pointing down, so it's a negative. And I also have the weight of the car pointing down. And that net force equals the mass of the car times its rate of acceleration in the y direction. And here's why I chose these coordinate axes up here, because with those coordinate axes, the acceleration in the y direction is zero. Okay, and let's solve this expression for the normal force, and you'll see why in a little bit. So if I factor out Fn from these first two terms, and then rearrange get this. Okay, so the normal force is equal to the weight of the car divided by this thing depends on the cosine of the angle of incline, the angle of bank, and the coefficient of static friction. <clears throat> All right, so now let's write down a Newton's second law expression for the net force in the x direction. And that will equal Let's see, we have an X component of the normal force equal to Fn sine theta, and we have a X component of the frictional force, which is also pointing in the positive X, equal to mu S Fn 
cosine theta. So that's the net force in the x direction. It's two forces added together. And that's going to equal mass times acceleration in the x direction, which again is a centripetal acceleration equal to v squared over r. All right, so now let's uh, solve this expression for fn. And that will give us factor out the fn from the left hand side here and we'll get a term that's like sine theta plus mu s cosine theta and we'll divide that into the other side we're going to get m v squared over r times sine theta plus mu s cosine theta And then let's set these two expressions equal to each other. So Fn equals mg over cosine theta minus mu s sine theta. And Fn, the normal force, equals mv squared over r times the quantity sine theta plus mu s cosine theta. We'll set them equal to one another and see what happens. So we have mg divided by cosine theta minus mu s sine theta equals m v squared over r sine theta plus mu s cosine theta. And just, oops, and just like the last situation with the flat turn, we have mass on both sides of this equation, so that will cancel, it'll go away. The mass of the vehicle doesn't matter. Uh, we still have a G in here, we still have a V, we still have an R, we still have a mu, and then we have a bunch of cosine and sine terms which depend on the angle of banking. And uh, so let's solve this for V, just like we did in the, the, uh, with the expression we got with the flat term. So if we solve this for V, we will get equals G times R times the sine of theta plus mu s cosine theta divided by cosine theta minus mu s sine theta and really what we have here is v squared so v would be the square root of that we get this expression, and we see similarities. If, if I can zoom out here, <laughs> well, I'll write, I'll write the result from the last with a, for a flat turn that's not banked. The solution for v max was the square root of mu s g times r. Okay, and for a bank turn, we get what's in the box up here. And so one way we can check our answer here is say, well, what happens if the bank turn has a banking angle of zero degrees? If theta equals zero degrees, what we should get is the result we got for the flat curve, where there was no banking. That's what the banking angle of zero degrees means. Okay, so let's look at this. Well, uh, if theta equals zero degrees, then V is going to equal the square root of G times R times the sine of zero degrees, which is zero, plus mu s times the cosine of zero degrees. Cosine of zero is one, divided by the cosine of zero degrees, which is one, minus mu s times the sine of zero degrees, which is zero. And that does, in fact, simplify to get a mu s in the numerator, and the denominator goes to 1. So you get exactly the same answer as we did in the first half of this problem, where we were just considering the flat term. This, this result right here is a result which will help you greatly with one of the homework problems that you have. Um, but it's not just enough to know how to plug given quantities for g, r, and theta into an equation, you should also know the physics.
physics behind where it comes from. And uh, so study this problem and hopefully it helps a great deal with that problem set. And that's it.